right, welcome back everybody. Super excited today. Uh, I've got a fantastic guest uh, with me. I've got Nick Loper from The Side Hustle Show and I'm sure that many of you will have listened to Nick's show. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, show for one about side hustles and entrepreneurialism, which of course relates very much to the sort of themes that we talk about here around gaining choice. Uh, but also it's just a really great quality podcast. Nick, uh, yeah, he doesn't do it by halves. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of podcasts in the world, but there aren't that many that are of, of the, the standard of, of the Side Hustle show. So i um, really excited that Nick, um, you know, agreed to jump on, on the program with me. So firstly, Nick, uh, thank you very much for giving us some of your time. You bet, Paul. It was great to uh, connect at FinCon earlier this this fall or this spring uh, in your part of the world. Yep. And it... Um, it's been awesome. And it's funny you say like, oh, you know, been doing the show for so long. Like last week I recorded three episodes with the wrong mic. And it was <laughs> kind of awful. And so I was like, you know, this dumb, dumb rookie mistake. So forgive me for those. The rest of them sound okay. At least the <laughs> ones. <laughs> That's right. I've certainly always thought that, uh, yeah, I've never come across any technical issues with your one. So, uh, but no, no worries. We'll make sure we forgive you for those, uh, those couple. <laughs> Um, so, look, Nick, I mean, I've been listening to your program for a long time, and I'm sure there are plenty of financial autonomy listeners who have done the same, but by the same token, I'm sure you'll be new to some people as well. So I thought we might uh, kick off with a bit of an origin story, just to bring people up to speed with the Nick Loper uh, story, and I guess particularly thinking through the prism of gaining choice, which is our theme. Um, maybe I thought I might just go through, I guess, my understanding, having listened to you for years, um, of a little bit of the backstory, and then you can correct me where I'm wrong and perhaps talk, us, talk to us about how that relates to gaining choice. So from what I've picked up, you grew up in Seattle, but you're now in San Francisco. You married your high school sweetheart, but not straight away. You took your time about that. Uh, you went to college, and then I know you worked at Ford for a while. Uh, you started a, a, a shoe business, was your entrepreneurial uh, entree, and I, and I think you worked at that for a fair while, as I understand, and, and would have learned a lot, I'm sure. Dabbled in a bit of blogging, and then that kind of evolved into the podcast that we know today, and the side hustle, and the blog, and that sort of stuff. So, very high level, that's what I've gleaned from listening to you for years. How did I go, Nick? Yeah, you nailed it, man. It nice. Was that, uh, it was that shoe business, that affair, affiliate um, kind of comparison shopping model um, shoe business. That was the original side hustle. That was the vehicle that let me uh, quit my day job, which was for wow. Ford, like you said. And then on the side from that started the the blog, the podcast and, and everything else several years down the road. And within really a year and a half of starting the podcast, that kind of became the main uh, the main focus for me. So just so just to take a step back in the chronology, so when was the shoe business, was that something you started while you were at college or was that after you'd finished up or what was the story there? Yeah, just before graduation. So yeah. this was kind of late 2004 in its very early, early iterations. And it really was probably not until mid 2006 that the um, the full version of the website or at least the, the, the you know minimum viable version of the website was actually live. Okay. And what was it you studied? Like, did you study business or something completely different? Yeah, I studied, yeah, I had a business degree, marketing yeah. degree. Yeah. And always had that entrepreneurial inclination? What probably really sealed the deal for me was a house painting internship, <laughs> internship in, in quotes, uh, during the first couple summers um, of college there, where it was like, hey, we're going to assign you a territory. You're going to go into this city. You're going to knock on doors. You're going to try and paint as many houses as you can over the course of the summer. And that was like my first real taste of working for profits and not wages. And it's like, you know, and at some points you're like, why am I out here at eight in the morning in the rain? And you're like, because like that's what it's going to take. And you kind of like, you go back and forth on this and, you know, a bunch of 19 year olds with paint sprayers and like everything that can go wrong does go wrong, but you figure out a way to work through it. And so that was a really formative experience. And it's kind of funny because the company at that time, I don't know if they still do, they posted this kind of on their internal blog at the end of the summer. It's like, if you made it this far, we've probably ruined your life. Let me, go, <laughs> let, let me explain. And it was, you know, you go on to read this post and it was exactly that. It's like, now that you've had a taste, um, because a lot of the people who started the summer didn't make it to the end. If, you, if you're reading this, if you made it to the end, you've had this taste. It's going to be really hard for you to go back 
and punch the clock for somebody else. Like now that you've now that you've seen the you've, you've taken yeah. the the pill in the matrix here. Yeah, gee, that, I mean that must have been a, a hard gig, I would imagine, to be yeah cold calling on people and hey, would you like your house painted? And by the way, I can do it tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> how did you persevere through that? Yeah, I don't know. Like the the dumb naivete of a, of a college kid, probably. Yeah. Um, I would like run in between the houses for because I thought I would cover more ground that way, and because I thought <laughs> that if the people happen to be looking out their window, like that would look more interesting or exciting than somebody like trudging up the driveway with a clipboard. It was it was a challenge, but it was really rewarding. Actually, it was really humbling because I quickly find found out I was not the best salesperson. I was not the best painter. I was not the best manager, but I was able to learn from some of my peers in the company and, um, and some other people that I worked with, like how to get better at that stuff. So that was, it was really important kind of thing, like this blue collar exposure early, <laughs> early on and figuring out not to, not to have so much pride that you can't get dirty with these guys. Yeah. Gee, fantastic. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I just think that would be incredibly hard to do. So uh, good on you for I don't know having the the, the fire in the belly to uh, yeah to push through and yeah, totally understand that. As you say, a lot would drop away, but if you can get through to the end of that, it's a real sense of achievement. I was telling my friend the other day about oh, I had to go rent this ladder because the ladders that we had weren't tall enough for this three story house. So go and load up this like forty foot fiberglass ladder. So what is that in? I don't know. It was really big. Well, and it, like, more was than hanging 10 off both ends. Yeah, whole, hanging off both ends of the truck. And they loaded it on there with a forklift. And I'm like, <laughs> well, that's great here. Like, what am I going to do when yeah, I get it end. to the yeah. job site? And it took three of us to like, oh, you know, we're trying to muscle this thing up. And it was, and, and that was one of the reasons, that was a job that, you know, we picked up from a previous crew that, you know, couldn't get it done, had to bail out. And so it was just, <laughs> it was like doing doing whatever it took to uh, to get it done, and even if that meant employing forklifts and having to rent special equipment to to reach the high reaches of these houses. And did you go up this mega high ladder? Because there's no freaking way I'd be up there. <laughs> we, yeah, I went up there, and that was one of the weird things about, especially early in the summer. Like you get out, you get up the next day, and you'd be like, "Why are my calves?" destroyed and you're like well i yeah. spent eight hours like flexed on a ladder yesterday like that explains it yeah okay so awesome so all right so th that is really insightful and uh yeah makes makes a ton of sense all right so that's given you the initial hunger and the initial taste of this is what i can do for myself and the ability to generate generate income and generate the amount of income that's sort of commensurate with the amount of effort i put in which um, maybe you're not going to get as, as a wage earner. So then you've, you've kicked off your shoe business. So, so just can you take us through a little bit? I know you touched on it earlier, affiliate angle, but can you just give us a, a smidge more detail? How did that business work? Sure. So this would, um, on the customer side, it would show you where you could find the best deal on your next pair of shoes and on specific models. So it's like, I'm looking for the New Balance, you know, model X, Y, Z. Um, you know, here's the 10 stores that have it. Here's where you can find, or here's all the different coupons that we found that are eligible for this product. Here's what we think it's going to cost to ship it to you. Um, here's what we think the estimated tax is going to be. And, you know, here's rearrange the table uh, accordingly. That earned commission from Zappos and Amazon and all these other different online shoe stores when somebody would buy through the site. Gotcha. It was, it never got a lot of love, um, in the organic Google search results, but did rely heavily on uh, Google's paid ad service at Google AdWords. And so that was my way of driving traffic to the site and kind of played that almost traffic arbitrage game. It's like, okay, if I could buy traffic for 25 cents, 50 cents, but knowing in most cases, <laughs> then there's always the trial and error, like, okay, that's gonna be worth 75 cents or a dollar on the other side. Like, okay, I can play in that gap and scale it from there. And was that, I know that you're not running it now and it, it, it sort of come to an end. Was that because eventually the Google AdWords, the cost of that just kept going up and up and you couldn't make it work anymore? Yeah, it was a combination of that and kind of getting squeezed on the other side too. So commissions, you know, this is over the course of eight or 10 years. So the costs yeah. naturally on, on AdWords have crept up over that time and, and the commissions were kind of trending downward during that time. 
and you know, good on good on Google for setting it up as an auction system where it's like, well, would you pay twenty five cents? Well, if you're profitable at there, would you pay thirty? You know, and they kind of um, they make uh, they got a good business, and meanwhile, yeah. everybody else <laughs> kind of has higher traffic acquisition costs. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Oh, so then you've got into that. Then you've got into the the side hustle side of things. The so. Uh, what was the trigger for you to decide, right, I can afford to quit forward here? Was there a particular instance or transaction that you thought, wow, I can do this? Well, there's a combination of things. So I wanted to see a track record of revenue. I don't think it was to the point of fully covering, you know, my, my day job income at the time that I quit, but I am pretty confident that it had six or 12 months of uh, at least covering my expenses. And so, you know, we live pretty inexpensively live pretty frugally and so that you know was a lower barrier to to reach i think i was making like 50 grand a year uh, working for ford at that time so that's the other side of things i'll get some people you know tuning into the side hustle show and they're like i'm making you know this high six-figure salary and they can kind of consider it like these golden handcuffs like it's hard to walk away from that so sure. didn't have that situation it was easier uh, to walk away from that and timing wise it was just like you know, right at the early days of, you know, the big uh, global economic recession. And so Ford was cutting staff left and right. And so I was like, if there was a time to get out, now is now is the time to get out. And so that was, and it, it still, it still took me like, you know, onto the second beer when I was out to dinner with my boss, to like <laughs> lay the news on him. Like, it's like, you know, you, you built this thing on the side, but it's still kind of this scary thing. Can I cut my own paycheck? And yeah. Am I really willing to, you know, put my money where my mouth is? Like I went to, I went to school and I did what you're supposed to do and got this job. And so it was, and, and once I, once I did that, it was like this huge like weight off my shoulder. It, it was very, it felt very freeing. So, I mean, there's a couple of things I want to explore from there. So one is, I guess, in your case, you had the choice about leaving forward, but from what you were saying, you know, they were laying off people anyway. So I guess there would have been some of your colleagues that maybe didn't have the choice and were just told, hey, the job's gone anyway. I don't know if that might have been your fate at some point anyway. But but your story there illustrates how, uh, you know, your resiliency has increased so much by having that side hustle that when economies turn or job situations turn or whatever, the, the fact that you had that out, you had that, you know, plan B that you could move to, presumably plenty of your colleagues would not have had anything like that and so when things are turning and jobs are getting cut it would have been a pretty horrible period whereas I guess your outlook would have been been very positive did, did you see that amongst your colleagues yeah it's very true it's like nobody else at least that I knew of like had that kind of backup plan or fallback plan so it, I definitely don't want to make it seem like oh is this martyr like to save somebody else on the team <laughs> like I'll I'll fall on the sword and go do this like it's something that I wanted to do anyways mm. and was really grateful to to have that opportunity and then once you were able to leave the day job and focus 100% on on you know your entrepreneurial activities did you see a significant step up did the extra hours that you had available translate into extra revenue rapidly or did that take some time or how did things unfold once you made that switch you want to know what happened paul on my very first day of self-employment google comes down and they say you know your advertising account no longer meets our quality guide <laughs> and so here i am i have you know i'm 25 years old i have these naive visions of you know the four, four hour work week uh, lifestyle yep. in, my, in my head and I'm like, this is going to be great. You know, margaritas on the beach type of thing. <laughs> and day one, they're like, uh-uh, buddy, <laughs> you wow. are out of luck. And so it was like 80% of traffic and revenue is gone in an instant. And it, in, at that time, you know, their customer support isn't what it was, isn't what it is now. And like, you couldn't really reach somebody. And so you volley these emails off into a void and you go through the you know, seven stages of anger and denial and everything else. And they're really vague about like what they want to see from your site. And they're like, well, you, uh, this site is in violation because it's just an affiliate site. The sole purpose of you existing is to drive traffic to other sites. I'm like, Google, look in the mirror. Like that's yeah. what people are for. <laughs> and, but you know, they didn't like that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> look, um, yeah, I had hair at that point. Like it was just a very right. stressful summer. 
what we ended up doing was adding a bunch more uh, internal links to the page to like balance out the ratio of outbound links versus inbound links. We added a bunch of kind of like template driven uh, content uh, to the kind of footer on the page that hopefully wouldn't um, impact, uh, you know, conversion because we, we did want people to click out to these mm. different advertisers. I think we removed, maybe we had like AdSense or something at the very bottom of the page and they didn't want people playing like an arbitrage game there. So we might have removed that. But ultimately after three months, they came back and said, hey, looks like we made an error. You're good to go. And just like that, it was back on again, back in business. And that first year of full-time effort into the site was was one of my best years in the business just up until a couple of years ago. So it was um, it was really strong. And that was when I like fully thought that I that I had it made and the shoe business was something I could do forever like that was a very good year yeah okay and and so that initial three months where you're trying to yeah reinvent the website and get things back up and running presumably had you still been at Ford it would have been tough to get that resolved I mean it took you three months as it was presumably if you're full-time at Ford it would have taken even longer yeah and you're investing all this money and development and without the revenue coming in without any revenue I don't even yeah. have a paycheck anymore it was and of course like summer 2008 like the economy is going to the absolute toilet and it was it was a scary time um, sure. it was yeah. a really scary time uh, well, and it's to your point like i don't know had i waited just another day or i guess you know i was at the tail end of my two weeks notice but had i you know, had I had that experience while still working at the job, because it had all been, you know, rainbows and unicorns for the most part up until that point, like that might have scared me, <laughs> sent, you know, scared me straight to like not, you know, not, not ever make that leap. It's like knowing, knowing what could happen. So in hindsight, of course, the timing was good uh, to get out when I did. Yeah, it is an interesting the way that the universe unfolds like that. Hey, could have been totally different. All right, well, look, let's take let's take a slightly different tack now. Obviously, uh, well, I know you've done over three hundred and fifty episodes of the Side Hustle Show, which means you've you, which means you've spoken to lots of different people with lots of different side hustle ideas. Uh, so I'm interested to to hear if you can think of one that was that just weirded you out, you know, or it's just, man, I would have never thought of that. That's totally left field. Have you got any funny stories you can share? Gosh, some of the more random ones, the guy who, who started a uh, parking lot litter pickup business comes to mind. He started this thing in the early eighties, but it's since turned it into this $600,000 plus a year operation man. where He's just like, yeah. He's like, oh, it's like getting paid to take a walk. I, you know, go early in the morning. You know, <laughs> this is how he started. Early in the morning before going to work, go pick up these, pick up litter in parking lots. And he just started by calling up local property management companies and has continued to scale it. Since then, that one was was really interesting. For sure. There was one of the kind of really inspiring ones was uh, a house cleaning service, which is um, from Chris... Chris Schwab from thinkmaids.com, which operates kind of in the Washington, D.C. area. He started it while he was still a student, a college student there. Yeah. Um, within two years, he was doing 60 grand a month in house cleaning in a, month. a field that seems like super competitive, super commoditized, not like, like it's been around for decades. Like, I don't know. People have been hiring cleaners forever. Um, what he found was in searching through like the Yelp reviews of these different companies, nobody complained about the cleaning. They were complaining about, I, I couldn't get a quote. Uh, I didn't know when the cleaners were coming. It, you know, was hard to get a hold of anybody. And he was like, well, crap, I could do that stuff. <laughs> and yeah. I, can, I can hire people who are already professional cleaners to do the actual work. And so that was kind of his strategy. And by throwing, uh, kind of a regional brand, the Thinkmaids brand, on a really fragmented industry. Like he was able to kind of stand out and make a name for himself in that space. In that way, it's similar to what Brian from uh, 1-800-GOT-JUNK has done. It's like, you know, kind of this unsexy, unglamorous type of blue collar industry. But, you know, now we have this regional and ultimately national and international brand around it, where it becomes like, Hey, who, who are you going to call? I'm going to call these these guys because they're they're the go-to people for it. So, in those examples, particularly, yeah, the cleaning and the and the one eight hundred junk uh, example, the 
it sounds like the the entrepreneurs that have kicked those off, the innovation there, or, or not so much the innovation, but the recognition is that that it was a customer serve, well, a marketing element, but a customer service element was the key to making those work. Is that is that a fair read? Yeah, there's a customer service element. There's a this like forward facing brand element where it's like, okay, mm. make it easy for me. And I think about the cleaners that we've hired you know because people will come by and they'll leave flyers and they'll be like call for an estimate and it's like i can i just can i just push a button on like just tell me what it's going to cost like that's, if you're 20 percent more than the person that i have to like call and you know work through broken english to figure out what's going on like that's okay like i'll pay that premium and so yeah. we've kind of proven that uh, that people are willing to do that and kind of taking these these fragmented industries where there is no kind of clear winner or market share leader on a regional or national level, like um, Belay Solutions is a virtual assistant company. I think it's belaysolutions.com, where it's like, you know, since the dawn of the internet, people have been offering administrative, you know, support services from their home. And they kind of recognize that and say like, okay, if we put a brand on that, if we put a management layer here, if we put a vetting process in for hiring these people, like we can charge a premium for that. So they've done really well. They've been on like the Inc. 5000 for years and years. So they've, they've done really well with that too. Well, I guess what we're talking about there is, is de-risking the transaction for the consumer, isn't it? That, that you, as yeah, a that's consumer, a really good you, way to put it. You go to the brand chair yeah, and you just you just have confidence that, all right, they're going to sort it out. And, and yeah, as you say, they're going to turn up on time and do all those kind of basic things that is the consumer that you want. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's really good. That's, that's some really good insights. I mean, have you seen any, any common ingredients for a successful side hustle over the, the various ones that you've spoken to and, and seen? Common ingredients. Um, a couple come to mind. The first is like a bias toward action and you could call it a you know willingness to fail a willingness to experiment willing to fail is actually uh, brian scudamore's book from 1-800 god junk which okay. kind of like goes through his his um you know process in starting this thing up um so that's part of it like looking at everything as an experiment which makes it like not life-threatening if this doesn't work out i have this hypothesis i want to test it out um i want to see what happens and that was the hypothesis my hypothesis with the shoe business was that I could carve out some market share from these larger comparison shopping engines by being specific to shoes. And my one criteria was I have shoes in the URL. So the first version of the site was called shoesrus.net, which is like the shortest version of a, of a URL I could find that still had shoes in it or something. It was, I recommend spending more than five minutes thinking of a, of a <laughs> um, so that's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two is like that driving motivational why, like what is it that makes you want to do this? Because it's hard, you know, it's none of this stuff is, is easy to do. And so if you don't have a strong enough why behind it, it's super easy to just go back and say, ah, forget about it. I'm just going I'm just going to go punch the clock at work and that's going to be my thing. So those two things kind of stand out, you know, in, in interview after interview. Do you think the why is something that people can clearly articulate insofar as can they say, right, well, the why is because I've got a mortgage and I really want to get it paid off for some particular explicit goal or is the why more, and, and I, I guess I sort of got this from your story that, you know, in college you're out there hustling and painting houses when most other people you know, probably couldn't be asked working that hard, quite frankly, but you, it, it's in you. And it's not like at that point you had a massive debt or children or anything that really made that inessential, but it was just in you. So the why of the people you've spoken to, is there a, a clear explicit why, or is it just something that's, that's just in them and driving them? Yeah, that's interesting. I've never kind of contemplated that because there, you, you definitely talk to people who are like, the stereotypical entrepreneur they just have this inherent drive and everything they touch if, if this one doesn't work out it'll be the next thing or the next thing or the next thing and then there's other people who are you know they have have more of that specific goal in mind and are kind of willingness to you know hold their breath for this sprint period and like okay i'm gonna do what it takes um one guy sent me a, a note and he was um, doing airbnb you know, on his apartment and the thing was when he would rent out his apartment, 
that left him homeless. <laughs> so that was a bit of a problem. Wow. So he was living in his car whenever his apartment was rented out. But wow. over the course of like a year or two or doing this, like that was $150,000 that completely erased his student debt, probably cut years off his working career. And it was like, yeah, a little bit uncomfortable in the moment, but it was that driving why of like, okay, I have this, you know, mountain of debt, like I have this financial hole that I'm starting in. And like, here's a way to really quickly erase it on top of what he was earning at his day job. Yeah. Fantastic. The, uh, just the other thing, when you were talking there about, you know, having a go and experimenting and that sort of stuff, recently, one of your episodes that I, I listened to was your 37 things you'd learn for your, your 37th birthday, which was a great episode. I like that. And I know there was one there that resonated with me that was a similar kind of theme and I won't get the wording quite right, but it was about um, that opportunities don't become evident until you're in motion. Something you, I'm sure you'll be able to express yeah, that yeah, better, yeah. But, but it was that sort of concept that I thought was really spot on. And that aligns with what you're just talking about there. Did you want to just, as I say, maybe put that in better words than the way I just tried to recount it? Yeah, it, it sounds so woo woo. And that, that was my first reaction uh, when the guest told me this was episode 72 from 2014. So I still remember this. Um, you know, he said the best opportunities aren't visible until you're already in motion. And I was like, what does that even mean, man? <laughs> but since then, like that has come up over and over and over again. It's like I started this, this one thing and then that led to a conversation about um, something completely different. Um, like I was on the side from the shoe site. There were, lots of, there were lots of projects on the side from the shoe site, most of which you know, never saw the light of day or never really got any traction. But it was during my research for one of those projects that I came across this um, site. So I was trying to build like a wine related site because we kind of like live in California. And I don't know anything about wine. You're I had no the, business. The, the Gary Vaynerchuk uh, uh, model. Uh, you know, I mean, it was all wine. It was his, his yeah, yeah. And, and no business being in, in the wine niche. And for that reason, you know, there was, there was no compelling reason for anyone to visit the site. But I was doing research for that. I found this kind of affiliate model site that was like reviewing different wine clubs. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And they had, you know, this kind of unique way that they were presenting this information. And so I was like, how could I, you know, pivot that to not wine, something I do, do know more about or something that I'm at least more interested in and ended up starting this virtual assistant kind of like review platform, TripAdvisor for virtual assistant companies or Yelp for virtual <laughs> assistant companies that was you know, a, a direct rip off of this, you know, wine club review site, but in a completely different um, industry. And so you never know until you kind of get started, you go down the path and, you know, I've, I've run that site actually for longer than Side Hustle Nation. So that's still going. And that started in 2011. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, that's fantastic. That's really great knowledge and wisdom to share. Hey, I guess in a similar theme, a problem that I, I know from you know feedback of people that I work with, and particularly I think it's the case with side hustles, a lot of people would love to have a crack at a side hustle, but for whatever reason, they struggle to get started. It's, you know, oh, I just, I just need the right idea. Well, you know, there's a bazillion ideas. It's not really that hard. The, the, the problem, they think the problem is the idea, but the problem isn't really the idea. The problem for whatever reason is just the, the inertia. Have you... Or what would you suggest for people that are just struggling to get that initial start and get the ball rolling? Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that, right? Because there's the people who are like, I just need an idea. And then there's the other side of the, the other side of the field is like, I got too many ideas. I need to know, you know, what to, what to pick. Um, if you are in that position of, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a side hustle idea, of course, check out the side hustle show archives, like Paul said, 350 something, you know, archive episodes, tons uh, to choose from there. If you find something that resonates with you, would love to hear from you if you take action on that. One kind of common uh, path that, uh, that people seem to take is kind of this like sweet spot intersection of, you know, what have you been paid to do in the past? Like what skills do you have? And actually I'll back that up. Like skill you have maybe you've never been paid for it before in your life maybe it's just something you've developed you know on the side from any type of, of paid gig you know what are you interested in what do you like to do outside of work and then who are you connected to or who could you reasonably be connected to like thinking about that network equation it's kind of like 
and maybe that's a little bit down the road of like, okay, how could I get my foot in the door? How could I talk to a potential prospect in this space? And this is specific to service businesses, but it applies to, you know, starting a blog podcast, YouTube channel, kind of like an audience facing business too. Like, what are you, what are you excited about helping people with? Like, what do you never get tired about talking about? Like for me, it was this lower risk brand of entrepreneurship. Like, no, you don't have to quit your job. You can build something on the side. Um, following the same framework, I started a book editing side hustle, like a proofreading side hustle. Okay. Whereas like, um, I was, a, I was a decent English student in school. I've done lots of writing myself. I've published a couple books myself. Um, in the interest side, like I enjoy reading. I enjoy reading nonfiction, self-improvement, like business type of books anyways. And so that was part of the gig, like niching down to say, I will proofread your nonfiction book. Like mm -hmm. I don't want to do your vampire romance or anything like that. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not your guy. Um, and then in the network was like, you know, I was a part of some of these different self-publishing Facebook groups, which ultimately became a source of word of mouth. I um, was connected with some course instructors for popular self-publishing courses. So kind of got on their preferred vendor list as an editor and actually circumvented all of that by getting several different clients through Fiverr and just saying like, Hey, uh -huh. here's my gig. I'll proofread your nonfiction book. See that? I mean, Fantastic. And uh, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned Fiverr. It just kind of highlights, you know, I guess when we're thinking about getting started that an advantage that we do have that, you know, wouldn't have existed 10, certainly 20 years ago is the amount of platforms that you could potentially float your idea through uh, and see if it gains some traction. And, and like you said, you know, you were, you, you were going different angles as to how you might find clients. And then in the end, it was Fiverr that delivered your first few and got the momentum, got the ball rolling. Yeah, they ended up being pretty decent average order sizes. I don't think it was, you know, a, an amazing hourly rate, but probably average between 20 and maybe 35 bucks an hour for some of these. Like, obviously, the better the better the manuscript is coming in, the easier your job is. <laughs> some of them were a little bit more, more effort. But, but you're totally right. It's like trying to find these mini search engines or these little platforms of buyers that you can put your thing up for sale, whether it's a physical product, whether it's a service, whether it's a digital product, um, like Amazon is one that I've taken advantage of for years. It's like, mm. hey, this is a huge search engine in its own right. And even more than that, it's like a search engine where people like already have their credit card saved for like one click checkout. So if that's books or physical products or even like t-shirts and stuff, it's, it's a fun platform to play around with. Yeah, great stuff. Hey, have you, of the various people that you've interviewed, is there been anyone that's really inspired you? Like not, not, not necessarily from an entrepreneurial point of view, but I, I would imagine that there would have been some people that have, have created side hustles for, I don't know that, you know, they've had struggles and, and, and perhaps the side hustle has been a way to work through that. Have you come across any interesting inspirational type stories like that over the years? Yeah, so many. The one that is top of mind is Teresa Greenway. She runs uh, a business called Northwest Sourdough, uh, which is teaching people how to bake the perfect sourdough bread online. She's got a handful of courses on udemy.com on how to bake sourdough. And she's got like 12 different courses. And, you know, almost all of them are about sourdough. And I was like, are you, are you worried about, you know, running out of content? And she was like, oh, honey, like I could do the breads of Spain. I could do this type of bread. I was like, I was like, okay, I clearly just showed my ignorance about the baking world. Yeah. But you know, she, her, she's a mother of 10. She kind of escaped, escaped this abusive relationship to, um, to, to be able to run this business. She told me that she filmed her first course, um, you know, in her kind of like dingy, poorly lit garage. And she's like, there's the reason is the camera has so much, of me, uh, you know, working the dough with my hands is like, I didn't want to zoom out. Like I didn't want people to see the oil stains on the floor and that I was filming in, in my garage. And that turned into when we spoke, this was a couple of years ago when we spoke, but she was doing like four or five grand a month in online course sales and had built one of the largest baking communities on Facebook um, as, as part of her tribe. So I was really uh, inspired by her story. Gee, fantastic. And, and I guess, Again, sort of, as I mentioned at the start, you know, 
the whole theme of financial autonomy is about how people can gain choice, gain control of their lives, I suppose. And, and yeah, what a fantastic illustration of the way that someone can use a side hustle or an entrepreneurial pursuit to, to achieve exactly that. That's, um, that's awesome. Hey, something I wanted to ask you, I know you work from home and I, and I also understand you got uh, a couple of young boys there. So how do you make that work? Uh, you know, the noise and the distraction and that sort of stuff. What's your tips for people that are, Maybe thinking about working from home. Yeah, I'm coming to you live from uh, the kids' uh, bedroom here. So I don't know if you can. There's the, there's the oh, crib. See, pull back the curtain. Well done. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, we're here from the uh, from this, you know, the bedroom closet basically. <laughs> this is my my home recording studio. No, the the real secret is sending them to daycare, sending them to preschool. <laughs> um, so right. they go um, pretty much full day, four days a week, and then. I hang out with them on uh, on Friday, and starting next week, yes, next week they'll be at the same school. So we'll have a single point of drop off, oh, and nice. that has been a good balance so far. Um, sometimes I have some guilt over like not spending more time with them because I realistically probably could. And so come come Thursday night, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to to hang out. I'm glad we got some time together. But then come Sunday night on the other side, it's like, <laughs> I'm ready to get back to work. I'm ready uh, to do this. It's definitely a balance. Um, but being able to, to shut, shut it down when they're home has been, has been good, at least until bedtime. And then sometimes we'll do a little bit of email, a little bit of kind of catch up after they go to bed. But that's, uh, that's our current system or setup. Have you found, like, with working from home, have you had any issues with loneliness or, or um, you know, th th those type of considerations? Sorry, you're gonna to have to translate for me. Loneliness. Uh, loneliness. Um, oh, you know loneliness. the fact that you don't have colleagues and people around. Is that been an issue at all? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Especially lately, I feel like I've developed a a very good internet network or network of of kind of internet friends. My wife calls yeah. them. So I don't feel that um, really at all. I've been working from home for. 11 years um, full time. And so that's not too bad. Once a week, these days, I'll go work from the coffee shop like half days on Wednesdays. Um, but I don't talk to anybody while I'm there other than the barista. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm still like heads down and doing my stuff. It, it was probably a detriment to me early on because I was so singularly focused and kind of isolated. I didn't have any mastermind groups, didn't have any peer groups. I went to a couple conferences, but even then, like, I wasn't really like on the, the inner circle of people there. And so it kind of felt hard to, to break in. Lately, I mean, that's one of the benefits of doing the podcast is you, at least, yeah, at least some of my guests are going to be there. Like, that's yep. going to be cool. I can, I can at least hang out with them. Hey, who else should I talk to? And it kind of spiders out. Um, and then forming the mastermind groups or being part of mastermind groups has been helpful kind of for that consistent, you know, weekly or at least every other week, like, okay, I'm going to have some grown up interaction during the day. Hey, what are you guys working on? What did you say you were going to get done? That kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Cause I just, I, I know that for some people that is a concern um, of, of going down the self-employment route and, um, even just from a self-discipline point of view, you know, there's no one to sort of make you get out of bed in the morning. I guess in your case with a young family, there are things that make you get out of bed in the morning, probably earlier than you would wish. But, uh, but yeah, no, that, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Hey, something I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, you, you're, you're beyond 350 podcast episodes, which is extraordinary because I understand that the average for people that list a podcast is about eight episodes. So most people have a crack and they quit, right? <clears throat> but you, you've persevered and you've, really persevered at 350 odd episodes and, and going strong. Um, how do you, how do you balance persevering versus knowing when it's time to pull the pin? I mean, you know, in the case of the shoe business, you did, you, I think you said you did it for eight or nine years, but yeah. it's come to a point where you decided, right, I've had enough time to move on. H how have you tried to balance that out? When to keep going versus when to say it's time to stop? Yeah, the rule for me is typically when you come to dread the work, and maybe the secondary part of that is when you come to dread the work and you're not seeing the results that that you want to see. And so that's kind of the combination for for the shoe business, where it's like no matter what we threw at this thing, no matter how much eighty twenty analysis that we did, like you just 
it was not coming back to its glory days. And so the, the opportunity cost was like, okay, you spend all this time and effort over here where it's like, there's, I think, a bigger upside and more fun to work on this other stuff. So that was the decision there. But man, the, the show has really become like a part of my identity. And I don't know, like if you look back at the numbers for the first couple of years, like maybe it wasn't a great move to to keep pushing away, to keep persevering, because not that many people were tuning in. But enough people were tuning in and the chart was, you know, growing at a clip that was encouraging, at least to me, where it's like, okay, you can kind of see where this is going. Podcasting is only going to continue to get bigger. Side hustling, I believe, is only going to continue to get bigger. Like, let's let's stick with it. So, And now I've got sponsors booked out through the end of the year. So I'm like committed <laughs> to doing the show every week anyways. Well, well let's, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that you're going to continue it for much longer because, yeah, no, it's a, great, it's a great podcast and a great contribution, I think. So, um, so that's good to hear. Thank you. So, so on... Um, you know, the future of side hustling. Uh, I know you've got a course coming out. Um, do you want to maybe just talk us through a little bit about what, what the course is about and how that might be useful for, for people in the financial autonomy community that, that as I say, that trying to think about how they can gain choice and how a side hustle might be a ticket to achieve that. Sure. So this is something that, thanks for that softball, by the way. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, the, uh, the course is about how to uh, start a service-based business, starting from no ideas to, to getting your first customers. It's kind of been a common theme, if not from people on the podcast, but just general side hustlers that you talk to is like, you know, the dream is passive income, right? But most people don't start there. Most people start with selling some type of service, selling, solving some type of problem for another client, you know? Um, so that's the idea behind the course, walking through a bunch of different frameworks to generate ideas, narrow those down and go out and kind of conquest your first customers, find somebody who you could help and get them to pay you. That's at startmysidehustle.com. And um, we'll see where it goes. I created it this summer as part of the Teachable Challenge. So Teachable is like the online course hosting platform. And they said, hey, three months, make a course, get your first students. And I was like, this is finally like the kick in the butt I need to like get, uh, to get off the sidelines because I haven't done a course in, in years and years and people have been asking for it. So I'm, we'll see where it goes. See where it goes. Oh, well, you know, well done for putting it together. I know I've, I've created a course recently too and uh, um, invest in shares with confidence for, for people listening if you haven't heard me plug it before. But uh, there are a lot of work to put a course together and uh, – yeah, it's kind of your baby, isn't it? I don't know about you, but, um, you know, editing videos and bits and pieces and trying to get it just right and trying to get it to something that you're proud of without getting to the point where you just never pull the trigger and say, it's done, it's got to get out in the world. It's, uh, <laughs> I found that quite difficult. So, um, and, and there's, that's the thing, like, there's always more you could include, but you like really kind of try and pare that down to like, look, what is the transformation? And this is where Teachable, a lot of Teachable's material was really helpful. It's like, what is the promise like what's the transformation that you yep. focus on because it's like there's 350 episodes like we could go into the weeds on hundreds of different topics <laughs> but Correct. it's like oh like okay focus 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 i was going to ask if you have your course set up as like kind of a open and shut like we're going to go through this kind of in cohorts or is it just open all the time no, it's op open all the time yeah okay. yep. for us that, that works better for for what we've got yeah how have you gone on that front I've only done a pair of open and shut launches so far, kind of like trying to get get, get some guinea pigs in there for lack of a better term uh, to see, you know, how they resonate with the material and how the flow of it goes and everything like that. But my long-term hope is to have it open as an evergreen product because the site generates a decent amount of traffic on an ongoing basis. And if this is something that could help you today, like I don't want to have to make you wait three months for the next open period. Yeah, that's how I feel too. You know, it's if people are they've got a something's cropped up and they've got a reason and they want help, uh, and particularly I think, and to some extent, it's back to a comment you you just made before about pairing the course back. I mean, I know the online courses I've done, and I've I've done several, and I think they're a fantastic way to learn things. But what you're trying to get out of it is it's hitting the fast forward button, right? You're not trying to sign up to something that's you know, a university degree that's going to take you years, months, whatever, you're trying to find, right, I need to get this outcome, this transformation, and and I want it, 
I want to get there as quickly as possible, but I also want it to be, you know, quality and robust, not just some sort of superficial 10 minute YouTube video. Um, so in, in constructing the course, you're trying to think about how can I get the person, the, the transformation that they want as quickly as they want, but in a, in a comprehensive way. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I hear you about that sort of pairing back, but it's certainly something that I wrestled with a bit too. In, and I, I'm sure I didn't totally get it right, but you got to have a go at these things and, you, and hopefully you improve over time as you get more and more feedback, I guess. Yeah. One hey, of the surprising things. Sorry, go ahead. All right, no, no, you go. Well, one of the surprising things was like in doing kind of the preliminary customer interviews, you know, well, Hey, I'm thinking about creating this type of product. Like what were the hurdles that you faced? Like, what was it, what was it like? Take me back, you know, two, three years before you started your business, like what was going through your head? And I was really surprised how often mindset came up, like, you know, fear of failure, fear of success, you know, what are my friends and family going to think? Like all of these kind of like head games that we play, imposter syndrome, stuff like that. I was, I was kind of surprised by that. And so there was some material on that, that, you know, <laughs> made it into the course out of necessity. Cause people were telling me like that was something that they struggled with, whereas I never would have guessed. So if you're kind of like on those side hustle sidelines, say, well, shoot, I could teach, you know, my expertise in something, something like have those conversations with your prospects, with your potential customers. And that kind of helped me form the, the outline for the whole thing. See, so that's really good wisdom to share. Thank you. Hey, I'm conscious of your time and I know you've got other things to get on with your day, so I better not keep you too much longer. But before we finished up, I guess I just wanted a sense of, you know, what's the future for the side hustle show? Are we going to, we're at 350 plus now. Are we, are we shooting for episode a thousand or, you know, what, how, how do things look? Yeah, it's been one of my longest running projects. And so it is, it's hard to project out like, okay, you know, you're still going to be doing this in seven or eight years. Um, at the moment, no plans to, drop it it's still super rewarding it's still super fun um you know to hear all these different stories and all these different marketing tactics and everything else but like you said you know the best opportunities aren't available or aren't visible until you're already in motion so definitely keeping the options open and one thing that's kind of on the on the radar for me is always like this common this constant question of like how do you be more effective with your time like how do you amplify the reach of this stuff while working smarter, while working less, while letting other people do what they're best at. And so that's always, uh, <laughs> it's always a, a constant struggle. It's like, okay, how do you, how do you optimize your, your efforts so that, you know, you're doing the most that you can with, with what, with what you have. Yeah. And, and getting that balance and not working seven days a week and 20 hours a day and these type of things, which it sounds like you, you've got, you've got the balance pretty well right there. Well, look, well done. And, and, and thanks again for, for sharing all that experience and wisdom and knowledge. I know you've got, you've got plenty of fans here in Australia and uh, I'm sure you'll have a few more after, uh, after some of our audience, uh, audience listens to you. So look, congratulations for everything you've done on the side hustle show. Uh, and I hope that listeners have really absorbed if and I'm sure you probably knew this already because we've, we've covered side hustle type topics in the past, but it's definitely that the side hustle type approach is definitely a way that it can help you with, uh, you know, gain choice in life, whether that's generating some extra income to improve your financial position, pay down debt, or, um, you know, however else sort of leave a bit of pressure there, but it, but it can also be uh, an avenue to move from being an employee to becoming self-employed, which of course is another way to gain flexibility and, and choice. So, a side hustle, very, very relevant for those interested in financial autonomy. And so um, uh, I hope that you got a lot out of today's episode. And, uh, and look, once again, Nick, thank you very much for, for sharing your time and, and your experience and your wisdom. You bet, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Financial Autonomy Podcast. Please keep in mind that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature. Your financial needs, circumstances and objectives are unique to you. Before embarking on any investment or financial strategy, you are strongly encouraged to obtain professional advice tailored specifically for you. Need some help reaching your financial autonomy goal? Visit the Work With Me page at financialautonomy.com.au 
to learn how Paul and the Financial Autonomy team can help you succeed.